Hello and welcome back to the People's Cardboard Podcast, Episode 3. I'm your host, Seth LaRue. You can find me on Instagram and YouTube at Soccer Card Corner. Today, I have a very special guest of the channel, the pod. Uh, I think, James, I think you were the first person when I started doing content that ever actually like reached out to me about like content or Instagram or anything. So uh, always great to have you back on the pod. Uh, how are you doing? Doing great. Yeah. So it's it's my fault if you lose subscribers or anything like that, right? It's okay. I was joking with you that every time I uh every time I release any sort of content, like the first thing that happens is like immediate loss of subscribers. So it's uh it's I've just come to come to expect it at this point. Yeah, but no, it's it's always great to talk soccer cards. And so uh appreciate you having me on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um so yeah, I guess like maybe we can jump in. Uh one thing that I was hoping to do to kind of set the stage of, of what we'll talk about is just, I'd love to kind of understand more or like have you share more about just your history as like a sports card collector, raw to grader, like basically just like your history in the hobby. Um, I think there'll be some interesting things to touch on, but I think just to kind of set the stage of like where we go, would love to maybe let you introduce yourself to, to the audience. Yeah, so I, I've talked about my story a few times, but basically, um, when I was growing up, I, I collected baseball cards pretty heavily as a kid. So all, all through high school, I, I did that sort of thing, never to like um, flip cards or anything like that. It was just uh, I was an Oakland A's fan, and so I was always trying to buy on eBay cards of my favorite Oakland A's players from like the the late two thousands and the early twenty tens. And so that was really my introduction to the the sports card market. Uh, and then once you get into high school and college, sort of just lost my way in terms of the hobby. Um, but I really transitioned my hobby to being FIFA. And so I, I played that a ton in, in college. I was a division one player for, for a couple of years in FIFA. And so I, I was taking it really seriously. And then, uh, as I was going later into college and postgraduate, I started playing ultimate team a lot. Uh, and that obviously has the, the card collecting aspect to it as well. And so. Uh, those were really my two things that connected me to the hobby. And then in 2019 and into 2020, I started getting back into physical cards and I moved into physical soccer cards because that was the sport I felt like I knew the best at the time. And it was honestly very, very cheap in comparison to the other sports. And so since I wasn't deploying a lot of capital into it at the time, I was like, I'm just going to buy a, a few little refractors or silver prisms of guys that are really popular in FIFA that maybe have some juice in the card market. So back then this would have been like Jaden Sancho rookie refractors for like a couple dollars or silver prisms of Leroy Sané or Marcus Rashford for a couple dollars back when those were like the guys in FIFA. So I was just basically uh, buying the guys in FIFA and just getting their physical cards because they were so cheap. And so um, I did that throughout 2019 and in 2020. And as sort of as the sports card market boomed, um, I picked up the pace with pretty much everyone else in terms of my involvement in the hobby, started doing a lot of raw to grade for soccer mainly, and then transitioned into doing basketball as well because everybody was doing basketball at the time, but mostly was focused on soccer. Um, kept learning as much as I could about the soccer card market, really transitioned into the pre-modern side of the market where there was almost nothing graded. And so there was a time on eBay, if a pre-modern card was on auction and graded by PSA, it was probably me that graded it. Um, there, was a, there was a good period there where I was pretty much the only one doing raw to grade of pre-modern pre -modern soccer cards. But now obviously it's a, it's a huge market, um, especially in comparison to what it used to be. But yeah, um, that's how I got into the hobby. Uh, then throughout 2020 and 2021, doing a lot of raw to grade. Uh, 2022, um, same thing, not as to a big extent though, because PSA increased the prices. And when PSA increased the prices, just didn't make a lot of sense to submit a bunch of cards at, at the bulk level that I like to send at. Um, I'm not sending in thousands of dollars uh, worth of cards. I'm sending in more cards in the 10 to $50 range raw. So wait for the price to come down. And then through 2023, I've had one of my bigger grading years ever because the I think the prices make a lot more sense now. It's $15 a card or $20 a card, depending on which specials you're using to grade cards again. So I've um, been back on that grind uh, for this past year. And as we move into 2024, hopefully uh, I'll keep that going. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I... I want to I want to dive a little deeper, especially in the early days, because I think it's really interesting as somebody who like similar to you, like got back into it, but not until like like most people, not until the pandemic. And by that point, it was, you know, everything was like basically the, the top of the bubble. Uh, things were peaking, uh, but there was still this idea that you could grade, you could buy a card for ten dollars. You could grade it for twelve dollars. And if it got a PSA 10, you could sell it for one hundred dollars. And if I got a PSA nine, you could sell it for like $40 or whatever, $30. Uh, 
and which obviously like we'll get into it you know in deep deeper detail isn't really how it is today but i'm curious just like when you started you were talking about like the rashfords and the sanchos and like some of those guys so you're buying like three four dollar refractor rookie cards and grading them and then like what were the returns on some like 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 in terms of just like the math like what did that look like back then it really depended on when the market was in sort of its phase, because I can remember buying a lot of, I think it was 10 or 15 Jaden Sancho refractor rookies. Um, and by the time the, I, I paid like $50 for a lot of 10 or 15 of them. And by the time they got back, they were worth like four or $500 in a PSA 10. Now that's not something that ever happens nowadays in terms of the, the margins, but it really depended if you, if you got the exact right point where you were buying in late 2019 or early 2020, and then it came back the summer of 2020, the values just got so ridiculous that you just got lucky in terms of where you were buying and selling. But I mean, even guys like, like uh, Timo Werner silver prisms were like five or $10 and even if you didn't exactly hit the peak on Timo Werner in PSA tens, they were like a hundred, one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, like base cards for uh, Messi and Ronaldo from the twenty fourteen Prism set, you could buy them for five to fifteen dollars each, and in PSA tens at the right time, they were between two hundred and five hundred, just depending on what was going on that week with the volatility. So it was really crazy. Um, you. I mean, I was running into it in terms of trying to build out an equation and say, I want to put myself in a position where if I get a nine or I get a 10, I want to eke out profit on either way. And so the the math just made too much sense to grade absolutely everything at the time. But as we'll talk about, the math doesn't support that anymore. But yeah, back then it was pretty much just to get the most obvious cards, the most obvious players and grade them because it was, it was just crazy. And do you think that that was a function of, I mean, obviously it was a function of just like, the market at the time but do you think it was also a function of just like the number of people that were grading because to me it seems like like wh why would like why would there be such a margin in doing something if like like other people who are buying those cards like they could just grade them themselves right if they wanted like a psa 9 or a psa 10 is it safe to say that like at that point in time like the idea of grading was much more like early days and and like nascent or whatever than like what it is today where like everybody grades everything like everybody's a grader basically yeah so in 2019 and 2020 i think the people that came into the market then were influenced by directly slabs just because that was the most obvious thing to do and it was readily available and even slabs were moving like crazy in terms of their volatility and people wanted to at least up until COVID started they wanted to go to shows and, and trade slabs and so that's a lot cooler and a lot sexier, so to speak, than sending something to PSA and waiting three or four months and then eventually getting your card back. And and like you said, a lot of new people came into the hobby. So I don't think a lot of people really knew about the grading process or how it was done. Uh, it's a lot easier just to go out and buy a PSA 9 or a PSA 10 than it is to buy a raw card, figure out how to grade it, figure out how I'm sending it to PSA, all the supplies that you need for that sort of thing. And so, yeah, it was a it was a knowledge gap as well as uh, an ease of access gap. And then you talk about why was nobody doing it? Well, I think for soccer, there just wasn't really a market for it before the COVID boom happened uh, because who was grading Jaden Sancho refractors? Who was grading Marcus Rashford prisms? Things like that. It, it, it just didn't make any sense to do at the time because, I mean, you can go back and look at the graphs. Uh, a messy 2014 uh, prism PSA 10 was like 40 or $50 uh, prior to the boom. Now, even now, I think it's a, over a $100 card. But at, at one point, that card was thousands of dollars during the COVID boom. So it just never made sense. And I sort of lucked into grading soccer cards when I did. Got it. Awesome. So I guess that begs the question, like, what, what was your biggest, what was your biggest win? What was your, maybe like, what are some like crazy stories from that time that you can, that you can share? Yeah, the, the craziest ones are going to be the ones that I, I bought for absolutely nothing. And then the, they came back from grading just at a super fortunate time. Um, the Jaden Sanchez are a great example. I had 10 or 15 of his uh, Chrome refractors. Um, I bought them for in a lot for $55 and they all sold based on if they were PSA 9 or PSA 10, between $100 and $500 each. And that's just silly uh, because I got them back at the at the perfect time. Uh, my most famous one, and I've talked to a few people about this, is if you look on the graph for on Card Ladder or Market Movers for the 2014 Prism Neymar Silver Prism in PSA 10, there is a one-week period where it sells for seven thousand dollars and nine thousand dollars before it crashes back down to like a thousand dollars a couple weeks after and one of those sales was mine i bought 
raw from ComC, a Neymar 2014 silver prism for $25. I sent it to grading and it came back when PSG was about to play the Champions League final. And I think Mbappe was injured at the time. So it was literally just Neymar carrying PSG. And it was during COVID and there weren't really that many sports going on. And so it was just a perfect storm and it sold the week of its highest point. And so I just got super insanely lucky with that. But yeah, those would probably be my biggest wins. And I I don't think I'll ever have something like that again, just because I don't think the market favors a, a condition like that ever happening again. No. Wow, that's that's a wild story. Just to think, of. I mean, like, what were you thinking? Like at that point, like you must have known, just given the the Jaden Sancho stuff, like you must have at least known, like, okay, this is probably going to do well if it gets a ten or even if it gets a nine, right? But I imagine, like, based on the timing, just given the way it peaked during the week that you got it back, like, like what were you thinking when you got it? And like, did you auction it off and then it just went way higher than, than expected, or like, how did that happen? Yeah, I guess that's part of the crazy story is the the weeks leading up to me getting the grade back from PSA were the weeks that 2014 Prism really started to get hot in the mainstream market. Like sports card investors started talking about 2014 Prism. Gary Vee was talking about 2014 Prism. There was a lot of action in discourse and on Instagram in terms of uh, 2014 Prism being the set that you should target for soccer because people weren't really into soccer yet, but once they started pushing 2014 Prism, there started to be a boom on the prices. You saw Messi Prisms and PSA 10 go from like $40 to $100 to $500, then $1,000. And so it just so happened that my Neymar went on auction and I put it on auction during that week where they, everything sort of started peaking. Um, but yeah, I, I sold it through PC Sports Cards who I, I used to do PSA grading through. If you're not comfortable with doing PSA grading yourself, I would definitely do it with them because I, I pretty much did it with them throughout COVID and have nothing but positives to, to say about my experience with them. So I was grading through PC sports cards. Um, back then they were doing an option where once you got your grades back, if you wanted them to make you an offer on your entire submission to buy out all your cards, they would do it. And I can remember them giving me an offer on that submission that ended up not even being what the name are alone sold for. So it just so happened that I decided to run it on auction and it sold as well as it did. So there was there was nothing smart going on with what I was doing. I just got extremely fortunate. <laughs> wow, that's an awesome story. Uh, so I guess now that we like now that we're in, you know, we'll call it the post pandemic boom market. Um, I guess like what's your current maybe like talk about like just your current hobby focus and kind of how you approach the sports card hobby, the soccer card hobby. Um, and then, and then we can obviously dive deeper in some other things, but just like kind of, how are you thinking about things now? Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, obviously I've, I've sort of put a break on doing content because oh, oh, for a few reasons, it's, it's a hobby when I look at it at the end of the day. And so when more life things get in the way, or I'm just not feeling the, the need to put out content for fun sort of thing, uh, I'll just take a break from doing content. And so I've taken a bit of a break for now. I'm, I'm probably going to get back into it at some point. It's just a matter of when. But uh, in terms of my navigation in the market, I'm still doing a lot of raw to grade. Um, I just like looking for the opportunities in terms of raw to grade. And that's how I enjoy the market. And then when it comes to my PC, um, I'm sort of trying to figure out what I want my goals to be for my PC. And I think that's a, an important realization I've gotten in over the past year or so is I don't just need to buy cards for my PC just to buy cards. I really want to have a strategy behind what I'm PCing and the cards that are in my PC. So I've been doing a lot of a selling of things that I had in my PC that when I look at it, I'm like, you know what, maybe that's not the best fit. I have a lot of really random stuff in my PC. And so I've been trying to organize it a bit better. And while I don't have a, an overall goal right now, I'm definitely thinking about what I want my PC to look like at the end of the day, because while it's fun to do a lot of this erotic grade and and recently my rod of grade has been not as soccer focused as it used to my rod of grade used to be maybe 80 to 90 percent soccer and the rest of it would just be random stuff i thought was a good deal now it's pretty much flipped into being maybe 25 percent soccer and 75 percent the other sports um but that doesn't necessarily mean i'm not in in the weeds on the soccer market i mean my pc will always be soccer just because that's the the sport that i love the most and i have the most fun in this market so yeah, just in an interesting spot in terms of I, I like the opportunity of raw to grade, still having a lot of fun with it. But in terms of what that's sort of building towards in my PC, still trying to figure out what that's going to be. Nice. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because a couple of really good points are because one, um, I would say I was probably in like a similar state where like when I first started, it was like, I love raw to grading. It's fun. And then I would buy cards that I thought looked cool or and like when I buy them, it's like, OK, I'm thinking about 
you know, you're looking at the value, you're doing the, the, the calculation of like, if this gets a nine, there's this profit, if this gets a 10, then it comes back and you're like, oh, that'd be a cool card to like keep in my, P my quote unquote PC, right? And, but then, yeah, I did the same thing where I looked and I'm like, why do I have these cards? Like I have these cards, but like even cards that I know probably I think have some room to run in terms of value. It's just like, I don't, I don't feel necessarily like a connection to some of these. So like, why, why am I holding on to them? Even, or even cards where it's like, clearly I've taken a loss on and selling them just means I'm realizing the loss. It's still, it's just like, I think it's healthy to just, okay, I'm going to move on from this. And then what I am buying or what I am keeping, um, you know, is stuff that I feel energized by or whatever you want to call it. Right. And I think the other thing you brought up that is interesting is, you know, I'm in the same boat where like my PC is, is, is all soccer. And I found myself grading more and more not, I mean, I grade a lot of soccer, but grading more and more non-soccer as well. And I think part of it ties into the first point where if I'm grading a lot of non-soccer, then I don't run into that issue where like I get it back and I want to keep it. It's like, I'm getting it back and I know I'm selling it because it's not, it doesn't fit within like what I've defined as my PC to be. Whereas like before when it was all soccer, it's like, oh, this would be kind of cool or this player's cool or, oh, I remember watching this guy, right? And then you just kind of get sucked into like, collecting everything yep. which which as we'll talk about more is at least you know unless you're like have unlimited amounts of money is like not sustainable um because you need to be selling things to kind of put that money back into the into the ecosystem or into the the flywheel if you will yeah exactly it's a and especially when like you said when you're doing rod grade and you're doing it in the the sort of the volumes that we're doing where you're getting a submission back maybe once every few months it's very easy just to pull five to 10 cards from a submission of 50 every month. And then that just keeps building and building and building. And then all of a sudden you have all these cards that you're not really looking at, but you just ended up collecting them when eh, it probably wasn't the plan from the beginning to do that. Yeah. I mean, even like even certain players that I PC, like I'll see cards on eBay and I'm like, Oh, that's a cool card. Or, Oh, I think that's a cool card. And it's, it's, I think it's too cheap. Right. And like, I just did this like not too long ago. Like I bought, like I bought like a Mo Salah. It was like a Prism Gold Wave PSA 10, like out of 10. But I'm like, oh, it it seems like it's going for really cheap. Like, that's weird. I'll throw a bid in and then I want it. And even now I'm like, I don't know. Like, do I want that card? Like, it's cool, but it's not really like, I can't collect like every Mo Salah card, right? So I'm trying to be like much more focused and disciplined about it. And so even still, like even with a focus, it becomes, I don't know, I, I still feel like it's challenging or I still run into like a lot of the similar challenges. Yeah, I, I will say I haven't really bought a card for my PCs that I know I'm going to be keeping for a really long time because I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what I want that to be. And I don't want to get in the trap that I've been in previously of just because I rotted graded this and I kind of like it, it ends up in my PC. I really want to come up with a, a plan for what that's going to look like. And so rather than just going out and trying to buy my way into it, I really want to take some time to figure out what that's going to look like. Sure. sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think so. I think what I'd like to do is maybe we can shift over to, you know, we kind of talked about the the math of grading and just like how it used to be. Like you said, it didn't make sense not to grade like everything you could because as long as you're being disciplined about what you sent in, you're basically like printing money because even PSA nines were, were, you know, you could make good chunks of money on PSA nines. Obviously today, that's not the case. Uh, today, it's really, at least in my, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts, but like in my opinion or my experience, it's like PSA nines or like raw cards are just more expensive than PSA nines in, in a lot of cases. So like not, or, or in, at the very least raw plus the grading fee ends up being more expensive than PSA nine. So you're basically looking at like, if you're grading cards, you basically need not only more tens, but like enough more tens to offset the losses that you'll probably take on the nines. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you have any other opinions there or any, any thoughts to share, but that's kind of how I'm seeing it at least, you know, over the past several months to a year. Yeah, I usually use the benchmark of the Bowman first rookie card auto for baseball as sort of the example of the most efficient market that we have, because that's the most um, active market that there is in, in sports cards overall is the because it's just so obvious in terms of baseball. There's one card that you look for for every single player, and it's the Bowman first prospect auto. And so I use that as my gauge of where the market health is sort of thing. And so now with Bowman firsts uh, with the autos it's now more expensive to buy a raw one than it is to buy a PSA nine. That's because the market there is so efficient. It understands that 
if it gets a PSA 10, I'm going to get a big premium. If it gets a PSA 9, I'll take a loss. And the market is so efficient that it has priced that into the raw card. Um, back in 2020 or 2019, and even some parts of 2021, it wasn't that efficient where raws were under PSA 9. Because And that, that always, from a, a math standpoint, always puzzled me was, why is a raw selling for less than a PSA 9? Because if you run out the equation for yourself, raw should outsell PSA 9 because it has so much upside in terms of it being a PSA 10 that when you run out of probability math equation, you should always be buying raw if it costs less than PSA 9. So now the market's becoming more efficient. I'm not saying that every market is as efficient as the Bowman Chrome prospect market because it's not, um, but you're starting to see the market get very efficient in terms of where it's pricing raw cards. It used to be no brainer, you should buy raw. Now it's you're going to be taking a bit of a probabilistic gamble with it. There are still spots in soccer and in baseball and in all the sports where you can find raws that trade under a PSA 9, or maybe you get lucky and you find a specific raw card that even if you get a PSA 9, you might eke out a small profit. That's really what I'm looking for personally. I'm looking for a raw card. doesn't really matter the sport, just something that I, I know the market of where it's raw in a PSA 9, I might make, eke out a small profit or go even. And then in a PSA 10, I'll win pretty big on it. And then you just need to get enough PSA 10s to offset your losses. And so that's how I'm looking at it. It used to be just send in anything obvious. Now it's, you got to come in with a very particular plan. And this is something that we've we've talked about before is when you look on Golden or PWCC and you see all these random cards that seem to get graded where it's a, a base chrome rookie from soccer or it's like a 10th year Griezmann insert that's not numbered. You used to be able to do something like that, but now the math just does not support grading random cards. Now the math is saying you got to be really careful and you got to really know what you're doing if you're trying to maximize this from an ROI perspective. Yeah. No, and I think that's a I think that's a great point because it's I think a lot of people look at that equation that that you just alluded to, and I think people I think like I don't know you watch like the broader market and you hear market sentiment on like oh like what's happening like the market's like crashing or whatever, and honestly like I think that to your point it's actually a good thing. I think it's just the market's getting more sophisticated. If anything, it's showing that like there's actually more participation. There's enough more, you know, like sophisticated participation to, for people to know that like, A, I can grade this myself and B, the the probability of me getting a nine versus a 10 versus something else. And then the resale value of those grades are such that it means that a raw is more expensive than a PSA nine. Like it's frustrating. Don't get me wrong. Like I wish it was just the other way, but I, I actually think it's a good thing in terms of just like hobby health and just you know, participation in the market. Um, j just because to me, it shows that like gen like the market broadly is becoming just more sophisticated, which maybe is my optimistic way of saying that that's a proxy for there being like more engagement. But I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think the people that have come in recently, and I think the, the majority of the people in the market are probably people that came in during 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. If you've stuck it out through to this point, you've probably gotten very, very smart in terms of the market. You've probably made some mistakes, you realize your mistakes, and now you're becoming aware to um, PSA 9s versus PSA 10s versus grading cards yourself, raw values, all that sort of stuff. If you stay in the market for a few years, you're going to pick up on all that. And I think the majority of the people that are now in the market know a lot about how to value raw versus PSA 9 versus PSA 10. Um, obviously talking about this from a, a people in the market, not necessarily looking to collect, but more on the financial side. I think they've gotten very, very particular and very, very smart with what they're doing. Um, so that's why the, the margins, I think, keep getting squeezed. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess on that note, uh, do you have any stories about your like biggest loss that you've taken in Rata grading? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've taken percentage losses. I've taken huge losses on like rookie stickers or base mega cracks cards. For example, uh, Kubo was a really big prospect in 2020. Um, I bought a bunch of his stickers and some of them graded like PSA 4s, PSA 5s, PSA 6s. Those you sell for 99 cents even in the slab. And so you're taking a massive percentage loss on those. Um, in terms of actual money, I bought a Pele Heinerle ungraded at the peak, which was like 3K in early 2021. Um, I got a PSA two and a half or a PSA three, and I eventually sold it for, I think, 1100. So I lost almost $2,000 on that. 
um, from when I bought it. But if I would have held it even longer, I think it's worth even less now. So it was just wow. a case of uh, get out while I still could sort of thing. But yeah, no, I, that was one of my worst buys of the peak is I, I bought a Heinerlay for like 3K and ended up selling it for one. Wow. I think mine is similar to your first one where I had this idea a while ago. It was it was the 2020 uh, Este sticker set where it had Pe- Pedri rookies yep, and uh, Eunice Musa rookies. And I'm like, I'm going in. I'm going all in. I found this guy on eBay in Spain selling like, I mean, that should have been the first red flag that this guy was selling like hundreds, hundreds. of them, right? Yeah. Like, okay, clearly it's not that rare, right? Um, but I did, but like I did, that was the thing is like, I did the math. It was like, okay, these are going to cost me like a few dollars each. And then I'm going to grade them. And then the resale values, at least at the time, here's, this was, there's a couple of mistakes made. One was the resale values at the time I was using like a proxy of like, oh, well, what did like prior year, like prospects, like what were their resale values like over time? So like on Sufati and like, like Kubo, like th- those, right? Yeah. Okay. Fine. So like I mean, and then I discounted those because it's like, well, it's not going to sell the same, right? Well, then the other mistake I made was that at the time, the only grading company that you could really grade with was SGC, and it was thirty dollars per item. So like four or five dollars per sticker plus thirty dollars per item, like that's a pretty big like cost basis right there. I can't remember how many I graded, but I want to say it was probably like more than fifty, but less than a hundred. Ouch. Range, and uh, for a while. I was able to sell them, you know, like I think I sold some of the Pedri 10s for like near $100, sold some Eunice Mooses for like 60 or 70 but the problem was just like, I couldn't sell them fast enough. Like I didn't want to put a bunch of them at auction at the same time because cannibalized, but then I couldn't sell them fast enough to where it made sense. And now, uh, I, recently I have auctioned some of the Musa 10s off because I actually had quite a few of those, but like on Golden and stuff like that, they're selling for like $17. So yeah. I'm taking like, you know, 50% losses just on like the best cards. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was one where it's like, okay, maybe the assumption, maybe some of the assumptions were good, but a lot of them were, were, uh, were flawed. So that was a good learning experience. Yeah. I mean, the, the good thing is you usually make, make those mistakes once really early and then you figure out why that happened and how you're not going to do it again. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, on that note, you know, we, we kind of talk about what the, the current math is and, and you touched on how like certain cards, it still makes sense. And, you know, you still target certain types of cards, I guess, like, in you know, in your experience or when you were looking at types of cards, like what are some of the, the candidates that you look for in terms of, of like raw to grade? And I think maybe to like underscore like the context of a lot of this discussion, I know that you and I both are very, you know, we talked about how we're very heavily involved in raw to grade. I think generally through the lens of like building up more liquidity to either continue to auto grade, but also like to fund like our PC eventually. Right. And so I think like the idea of that is not that we're just doing this for fun or even doing it for like monetary purposes. Like we literally need to make money so that we have money to spend on things we want. Whereas if we lose money, overall goal is to make your PC free. Exactly. Like, whereas if you lose money, then not only is your PC not free, but then you don't get to actually buy a PC because you're not making any money. So anyways, um, yeah, I, I, on that note, what type of cards are you, are you looking at, or maybe just like the characteristics that you're focused on when you're, when you're looking for raw cards? Yeah. So I'm being really specific these days. It's superstar obvious players in any sport. So like for baseball, Shohei Otani or Ken Griffey Jr. or guys like that, um, for basketball, Steph Curry, super obvious stuff like that. Giannis guys like that. Um, for soccer, the most obvious guys, Messi, Holland, Ronaldo, U.S. guys, that sort of thing, um, and just run down the list. And then important sets or nice-looking cards, and that would be – it paints a very broad brush, but when you only have eight or nine players that you're looking for, you can scroll through all their listings pretty pretty quickly, and you can just learn, a, oh, that's a really nice-looking card, and it's pretty rare. I think that would do well in a PSA 9 slash PSA 10, and you're looking for those opportunities. So uh, for me right now, it's – Player is most important because I think there's very few players that have very, very strong markets. And I want to put myself in a position when I auction my card that it's going to have a lot of watchers or a lot of potential buyers on it. So focusing on the most obvious players, then down to 
obvious sets and then just nice looking cards in general. And so in, in terms of price points that I look at, I try to stay between $20 and $200 raw and then under $500 when it's PSA 10, just because I think that's where the most buyers are at. So from all perspectives, I'm just trying to line myself up to appeal to the most buyers possible. Got it. Got it. And it sounds like it sounds like the you know, the part of that targeting is is about just like uh, sort of risk mitigation too, in the sense of like Messi's not going to tank a hundred X or whatever overnight. Correct. Whereas like some prospect that you buy today, who's hot by the time you get the cards back in three or four months, who knows, right? Like, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, what I noticed in looking at my own data is that when I was taking shots on prospects, every now and then you would hit on one and you'd have a massive ROI. If you got a PSA 10 on a guy that was undervalued when you sent it in, then he popped off and your ROI went way up. But more often than not, you bought a prospect and while it was at grading, it either did nothing or dropped. And so when that happens, you're just sort of screwed. Even if you might get a PSA 10, you still might be in some trouble there. Uh, whereas with Messi... Ronaldo, Holland, Shohei Otani, King Griffith Jr., those sorts of guys, even if the the boom isn't there for their prices, it's so steady that even if it drops 5%, 10%, as long as you did your math okay, you're going to come out ahead. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I guess in terms of uh, like where to find cards, like you know, I know we talked about a lot about this, about I think, you know, where we target cards and like maybe how that changes over time. Like, how do you think about that in terms of like when you go to look for cards, where are you looking for cards? Um, you know, what are the factors you look at when thinking about whether to focus on a specific marketplace versus others, things like that? Yeah, for a long time, I was just strictly doing card hobby because it was... Uh, at least at the start of this year, it was still not really a super known website or application at that point. And so you were able to pick up raw cards really, really cheap. Um, but now that it, the card hobby, I think it's very, very mainstream in terms of if you're on Instagram in the card community or if you're deep at all, you know what it is. And so now everything is sort of running, running at eBay comps. And so I still buy a little bit on there, but I'm not as heavy as I used to be. The real um, value from card hobby, in my opinion, was you were maybe going to get cards that weren't as picked over for grading. Whereas on eBay, so many people now in the United States know how to raw to grade that if you're on eBay looking for raw cards, you're competing with a lot of people that are also looking for raw cards. So the odds that the raw card you're looking at, if it's not from a brand new set, has not already been looked over is pretty low. And so the, the raw cards are just making their way through the chain of somebody looked at it, they couldn't grade it, they're selling it on eBay. Next person gets it, they can't grade it, they're selling it back on eBay. So that makes it tough on eBay. One of my tips, I guess, for that, I don't do a ton of buying on eBay though, is you wanna look for lower feedback buyers and don't buy raw cards from consignment because the reason the raw card is on consignment is because somebody tried to grade it and now they're trying to dump it on consignment. That's what I do. Uh, I think that's what a lot of people do with their raw cards. So I wouldn't be buying there. Um, I think still the international markets are the best play in terms of potential ROI. Whether that be card hobby, if you find something that falls through the cracks, whether that be um, buy e, which allows you to connect to Japan and those markets, uh, sometimes you can find those cards for cheaper than eBay, and they're usually in pretty good condition. Um, if you want to really grind out, like I used to do, I used to check all the Spanish sites and all the Brazilian sites and all the Netherlands sites, just try and find very specific cards from those regions. If you want to grind that out, you can probably do really well, but. Yeah, me right now, I'm, I'm still trying to focus on eBay sellers with low feedback and competing really hard for raw cards, but it's not my favorite. Uh, and then card hobby, trying to find something that slips through the cracks or um, buy ye for the connection to Japan. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I would say mine's probably the same. I think one thing I have definitely noticed, and it kind of goes back to the the formula discussion around and just like kind of how I approach the buying is like, you know, you mentioned card hobby. And even even people like Messi, like even some of the exact players that you were talking about, um, there's some cards where it's like, okay, I, I'm watching this card. I know generally what it should go for, like on eBay. And I'll basically just put a bid in that if I win it and it's not gradable, I can probably sell it on eBay and like come close to being even. Or or you know, similarly, if if I buy it and grade it and it gets a nine or a ten or nine, I'll be relatively even. Or ten, obviously, that's like what we're shooting for. And what I've found is I still win stuff every now and then, even messies, right? Like I still win stuff that maybe it's just like the right day or 
maybe my bid was just higher little you know well obviously a little higher than everybody else's but my point is like it still kind of works the the thing that i've run into or like the issue i run into is then like the it's hard to get volume obviously like and that's the piece where it's like obviously if you're going to realize some of the percentages around psa 9 versus psa 10 versus like maybe ungradable the best you know the, the best way to do that is like the more volume you can find like the better chance you have of like you know realizing percentages whereas like if you find five cards they could all be tens or they could all be trash like right how do you think about that because that's something that i honestly haven't really solved and what it results in is like i probably do a psa order like every two or two or three months like maybe i do four or five a year i'd love to be able to do like one a month but i just i haven't been able to get enough cards at prices that i think make sense in the condition that you know makes sense to do that so uh, yeah over the past six months i've struggled with exactly what you're struggling with in terms of i bid on a ton of stuff and i don't win maybe more than five to ten percent of the things i bid on because i'm doing what you're doing um i'm trying to put myself in a position where if i am not able to grade the card i still want to be able to sell it raw and get my money back if at all possible so if that makes me lose 50% of the auctions I shouldn't lose. I'm okay with that just because I want to, I, I personally like to be very risk averse in, in my buying. So that has stunted my, my volume that I usually grade. So recently I've decided to try and take more shots in terms of if this doesn't come back in gradable condition, it's okay. Cause if it's a small loss, but if it gets a PSA 10, I could really hit a home run with it. Those are the plays I'm starting to try and look at now because I do need volume to continue the, the train going. So now I'm more looking at what's the home run potential of something versus what's the absolute floor safety, just because I think the play of being at the absolute floor safety is just not there anymore right now. Yeah, I can, I'll win five to 10% of my auctions, but that means I'm going to send out a PSA submission once every three months or something like that. And that's just, it's not high enough volume for me to, to feel comfortable with getting bigger returns. And so I, I'm starting to try and mix up my strategy to be more, yeah, I might overpay for something, but if it gets a PSA 10, I'll really hit a home run on it. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. That's, that's something that I, I, I find myself when I when I do PSA videos or when I'm doing like here's what I'm planning to grade like I keep saying the same thing I actually have to like edit it out sometimes because I'm always talking about like high floor high ceiling opportunities but that's exactly what you're talking about where it's like how do you like basically finding cards where it's like hey if if I get a nine or, or if it's not gradable my loss is going to be small relative to like the upside of getting a ten and then over time if you grade enough obviously hopefully you get enough tens to like you know, make up for like the outsize, uh, like have outsized gains versus the losses that you might get with, um, with nines. I, it is hard though. And especially because of the, like the raw being higher than the nine, you're basically saying like, well, if I don't get a 10, I'm losing money. Yeah. And I think unless you're like prepared to buy it, like a high enough volume, that's like a really hard thing, like in a vacuum, like for a specific card to like pull the trigger on where it's like, well, mm -hmm. if I buy this, I'm almost like guaranteed to lose money. Well, I am guaranteed to lose money unless I get a 10. Right. Yeah. And that's sort of what I've had to pivot to more recently over these past few weeks is I've started to go more into that strategy. We'll see if I, it ends up burning me or something, but I, I've started to say, screw it. I will pay the raw is greater than PSA nine just because I've looked at this card. I think it has a good shot at gemming. And if it does gem, it'll make up for the two or three that don't that sort of thing. Uh, and so over time, if you have enough volume, the numbers should play out and you should win. Whether that ends up being the case is a factor of one, you need the volume to be there. And two, you need to really trust your eyes and, and your sort of instincts on if this is actually going to be a good buy, because sometimes it just won't be. And I, I think that's something that SCV Sports Card talks about. If you watch uh, some of his videos is you either have the instincts for buying raw cards that you've built up over the past few years, or you don't. And I've gotten to the point where it's like, I'm going to trust my instincts a little more than the math. And even if I have to pay for over PSA nine for this raw, I feel really, really good about my instincts on this raw. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. So I'm, I'm trying to lean more into the expertise that I know I have, but the math part sure. of it, it's a little scary. Got it. And, and when you mentioned like the expertise there, you're talking more about just like, not necessarily like, oh, I think this card is probably going to be a PSA 10, but just more about like, 
the understanding that like if this gets a PSA 10, the game like the upside is much higher than like any potential downside of getting a PSA 9 or like whatever. Just like the knowledge of like where this card would be in terms of demand and like uh, resale value and things like that. And in, in yeah, it's both of those things. It's in looking at the card. I'm I can look at a lot of cards even in scans and feel pretty confident if this is a nine or a ten or less. Um, but then, like you said, that second step is also: Am I confident that by the time this gets back from PSA, what do I think a ten value is going to be? And if I'm confident on both those factors, I'm starting to lean into that more because I, I do feel like I have an expertise that allows me to take more risk like that. Um, but we'll end up seeing if it works out. Do you find that with that? focus that you target like specific sets or specific like whether it be like sets or inserts or whatever types of cards more just given that expertise or maybe familiarity yeah so for example i can talk about two very particular cards that i'm like a super expert on one of them is the fuller and balligan prism rookies i can look at those it, it just through scans and i'll know if it's going to be a psa 9 or a 10 because I, I know so much about that card after looking at so many scans of it, and it's the same card every time, that I can just tell what I'm supposed to be looking for. Like on the Balgan, you're looking for the bottom left and the bottom right corners to see if they have any whitening. You can tell the centering based on the little red marks on the bottom left and the bottom right. If one of them's thicker than the other, it's not centered. Um, you check the top left and the top left, uh, top left and top right backs. And so a card like that, I've seen so many times and I'm so keyed in on it. I I'm very confident if I can identify if that's a 10 from a scan or not. And then from there, it's just knowing the values. Um, but another one would be, would be like, um, some of the Shohei Otani rookies from Japan. I've looked at so many of those that, and I've graded quite a few of them that I know what a nine or a 10 is going to look like. So now I feel pretty confident in looking at them. So yeah, if you grind enough of a certain particular card that you feel good in and you see enough of them and you grade enough of them, you'll get to a point where it's like, okay, I know what I'm looking at here. Yeah. That's how I feel with mosaic cards. Like yep. I feel like when I do like reveals and stuff, it's like, I have so much mosaic and I don't even, I honestly don't even really, I think in my collection, I may, ha may have like one mosaic. Um, but for the most part, it's really just, I've graded so many of them. And this goes back to like, when I first got into the hobby grading, like first year mosaic football and basketball that the, the backs, you generally kind of can tell if it's like got a mess up corner and the front centering, you can like, depending on the year, there's like very clear and obvious ways to tell like whether or not it's centered. And then usually given the mosaic like front, unless there's like a gnarly, like surface scratch that would be obvious yep. it's usually pretty clean and so it's like i don't know it's just, I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself an expert but definitely like one of the sets or the types of cards that i find myself like gravitating towards because i just kind of same same with you like and kind of know like this is probably going to be a, at least a nine likely a 10 if it, if it checks all those boxes yeah, exactly. And it's a matter of once you have that expertise, you sort of carved out a little niche for yourself. Because a long time ago, I was one of the only people grading pre-modern. So I sort of carved out that niche for myself. Now it's trying to find more niches. And because the, the thing about this hobby is, is the hobby is so particular about what it focuses on at a given time that if your niche is hot, you need to hit that until it's not sort of thing. And so if if you get really good at one certain set and all of a sudden it gets hot, you should continue hitting that until it doesn't work and then you pivot to something else. And so that's something I think I've done very well over the past few years is is recognizing what the niche is that gets pretty hot, um, trying to find the raw cards for it. And then when it's not there, don't continue to push it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess on that note, do you have any um, grading success stories about the, um, what is that Disney set that was in China? <laughs> oh, the the caca wow disney 100 set yeah 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 that one was funny because I, I remember dming you about it like a week before it got really hot and i was like this is gonna sound crazy but i'm gonna start buying these disney cards from china <laughs> because I, I saw like a, a few twitter accounts that had a few thousand followers starting to talk about the set got and it. i was like these are so cheap and the, the ip is so big that maybe there's a play to be had here so i i bought two or three complete sets basically uh, of the refractors of those cards when they first came out and you could buy them from china on card hobby for like a complete set was maybe 10 or 15 dollars and so i had two or three complete sets and it just so happened that i sent them on consignment uh the week that they started getting hot and i recognize a lot of profit from that just because i got lucky and so if you spend enough time on social medias like i guess i did back then uh then you can sort of pick up on those things and make plays but yeah, every every now and then you'll just get lucky and come across something like that. 
Got it. Yeah, I thought that was uh, a fun, a fun. That was like a random message that you sent me that I thought was funny to monitor those cards and like how they, how the auctions went for those uh, over those next several weeks. Yeah, um, that was that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like in terms of like strategy, then it sounds like you know focusing on obvious players, focusing on sets where you have kind of an expertise or some level of expertise, trusting your instincts on whether or not to kind of pull the trigger or go above maybe you know, the, the PSA nine or the, the, you know, comp price, um, anything else in terms of like strategy, I'm assuming like PSA is still being like the preferred grading company given resale values or like anything else on that front that, that you think is worth sharing? Yeah, I wouldn't grade with anybody, but PSA right now, unless you're doing it for collecting purposes, but if this is a, you're trying to make money sort of thing, I, I don't see any reason not to use PSA right now. The premiums are just too good. Um, if you run out the math, you'll see it. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would say is if you're not confident in the set, you can look up the pop report to see what the gem rate is for the set. And if you're approaching a new set, if I, if I see a new card and I'm not familiar with grading the set, I'll always look at the PSA pop report. And if the pop report says it's tough to get a 10, I'll listen to the pop report and just not even risk it at that point, because the odds that me, my first time looking at this set, am going to be able to judge what a PSA 10 is. If it's a tar, if it's a hard to gem set, it's probably not very high. Uh, but if you run into a card that you find and it comes from a set with a really high gem rate, uh, then you can start running the numbers out and probably feel a bit better. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, um, run the big math equation out for whatever you're looking for. But once you start to feel really comfortable, you probably won't need it anymore. You can just sort of do it in your head. But yeah, if you're just starting out and thinking about raw grade, I encourage you to build a spreadsheet and run out the probabilities for I'm going to buy it raw at this price. I think in a PSA 9, it's going to go for this. I think in a PSA 10, it's going to go for this. I think it has a 50-50 chance of getting a 9 or a 10. Run out that probability equation in Excel and have it spit out the value that you should pay for it raw. That's what I did for my first few hundred cards that I was grading during COVID. And that's how I was able to, to build up. So that's the fundamentals I would go through if you're starting out raw to grade. But after you do a few hundred, maybe you can probably feel more comfortable to, to do it without the cheat sheet. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think that's where like using that pop report, like if you're not sure, like you could even use the pop report to in, uh, inform those percentages, right? Like yep. if 75% of it is tens and 25% of it is, you know, nines, you could basically say like, oh, it'll probably go 75, 25. Maybe if you're not confident, you can, you know, discount that down a little bit and make it 70, 30, 60, 40, whatever. Uh, but I think that's a great point. Cause yeah, I think it's like, I think people, myself included, are generally like so excited just to like buy something and grade it because it looks cool. And then you realize like, oh yeah, there's a reason why uh, you know maybe this went for a certain price because these aren't at these aren't you know these are hard to gem or these are hard to um, to grade in general, right? Yeah, and I still do that sometimes because I'll I'll take some flyers and be like the first one to grade a specific card or a specific set, and those are just shots in the dark. And so it, there there are times where I think it it makes sense to take a few risks. Sure. What about um, selling cards? I know, um, you know, you mentioned SCV. Um, I was watching one of his videos where he basically said something along the lines of like, basically like you need to be, <laughs> the way he put it was hilarious, but it was like, basically like everything should go to auction. Like you need to, you need to be like confident enough in what you're buying to send it to auction. And if you can't, then you're basically like not buying the right stuff or you're not paying the right prices for it. Yeah, it's, it's your fault if you bought something that you can't send to auction. Exactly. Which I think is, which I think is actually like generally a really good like sentiment to think about because it, I think it would help like cut out a lot of the stuff that you maybe might get distracted by. The one caveat to that type of stuff would be like very low pop, like collector type stuff that like, okay, I don't want to like send this to auction just because it's it if, if not if the right people aren't looking at it or looking for it then um you know th then it's not going to sell for very much but i guess the the flip side of that that you have to be okay with is just like okay well it might sit on ebay then for months until the right person sees it or finds it or or whatever but like how do you think about just like great like selling graded cards do you send everything to auction do you think does it does it even change whether it's like a liquid card or a niche card does it even matter like how do you think about that yeah i i treat i try to be as cutthroat as possible in terms of my strategy with selling i'm not as as cutthroat as scv is in terms of you literally get sort of everything but if i'm going to sell something it's going to be on auction and i'm just going to let it ride and and let it happen treat the card as a line item and just let it go um I just personally have never been one to like doing the back and forth on buy it now or best offer. I'd rather just 
have the action go the way it goes and move on to the next thing as sort of a, a speed and velocity thing. But I can understand cases where buy it now or best offer will get you a higher price. It's just not something I've ever really been interested in doing. But yeah, I mean, even recently, I, I straight up auctioned a Jude Bellingham one of one um, tops Jade Foil Fractor. Like, that's not a card that normally goes to auction. But the reason I did it is because that's not a card that normally goes to auction. And so you get more people interested in it. And maybe it goes on a little bit of a run. So yeah, I, I, I just like auctions for the speed and the consistency of them. Whereas with uh, a buy an hour best offer, I'll, I'll have to wait and field offers and do that, that whole uh, the dog and pony show that comes with it. At sometimes will you eke out bigger profits than you will on auctions? Probably. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, over the course of a, a long amount of time, I don't want to be dealing with it, but I, I can definitely understand the reasons why somebody would. Yeah, I find that like, cause I, cause I hear different people have different opinions on this and I definitely go back and forth and frankly, what I do is I basically do both. Like I have yep. some that I put on eBay that sit there. I have others that I auction on eBay. I have others that I just send to like golden or something on auction. If I think it's going to be something that would sell better, like at a bigger, you know, more reputable auction house. But it's interesting because I, cause I've seen some people where it's like people like to build up an eBay store and just have like a store. This is like my eBay store and where all yep. my, all my graded cards go you know, when I talk to you, it seems like you're on more on the end of just like, Hey, I graded these. I want to sell these so I can grade more cards. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, I think that makes total sense. I think it comes back to going back to like, depending on what your sales strategy is almost informs like your buying strategy. Cause like, if your whole point is like, I want to buy cards that I want to be able to auction immediately. It probably makes sense that you're focusing on the obvious guys when you're buying so that you can auction them immediately without really work. Like, sure, maybe it goes for less than it would buy it now, but it won't go for enough less to where you really like feel it or notice it. And then sometimes it might go for more uh, just if like it's the right time of year, or you know, the timing is right. So I, I think that's like, it's, it's something I haven't figured out, but I, the more I think about it, the more I think it's like, it really does come down to like what I buy almost informs like wh how I sell it which then kind of informs what I buy, if that makes sense. Yeah, I never really actually thought about it in a, a super well thought out way like that. But what you say is true in terms of I'm buying things that I want to auction and I know I'm going to do well on auction because it's it's my preferred way of selling. I never, I don't really think too much about it, but no, when you say it out like that, yeah, I'm, I'm buying cards with the intention of auctioning them. So my buying strategy is very now mirrored to the, the end result selling strategy. So I, I would recommend if, if you're thinking about doing a certain selling strategy or a certain buying strategy, know where both of those ends are, are sort of leading to. Because if you're buying really rare cards of players that aren't the most mainstream, it might be better to be one of those buy it now or best offer stores. But if you're doing something like I'm doing, where you're just doing mainstream players and focus on mainstream sets, you can probably feel safe to auction. It just depends on how you want to play the market. Got it. And then how do you, and then what about just like where to send it? Like, eBay auction yourself, send it to consignment, which consigner, like, I don't know, what are your thoughts there? I have thoughts too, but just curious to hear what, what you think. Yeah. Um, if you want to, and have the time to do it through your own eBay store, you should do it through your own eBay store because that's the, it's the most safe thing to do and you can build up feedback and you can build up your eBay store and that sort of thing. Um, I personally don't like dealing with eBay and I don't really think I have the time to, to sit there and, and do as many auctions on graded cards and deal with shipping and feedback and all that sort of stuff. So I just send all my graded cards to Probstein and all my raw cards to DC Sports 87. And I've been doing that flywheel for the past six to nine months. And it's been going very, very well for me. And so I'm just going to continue using those two auction houses. Um, you can find reputable auction houses even besides those on eBay, but Golden works as well. PWCC works as well. Um, just look into a few different ones and decide which ones you like the best. Those are those are just ones that work for me. And I personally like just uh, letting somebody else deal with the eBay part of it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. I go back and forth. I actually something about it. Like I like just selling it and like shipping it. It feels like like the whole like I bought this card. I graded this card. I sold it on eBay. I shipped it out. It's like the whole cycle me doing it. It just feels I don't know. Something feels very like satisfying about it. Mm -hmm. Other times I'm just like, yeah, I don't want to deal with it. I have been sending stuff to Golden. Um, I keep going back and forth with Golden support because every time that they put one of my cards at auction, it doesn't have the serial number information. So it'll just say like Killian Mbappe gold refractor or like, or maybe like a better example would be like the, the Balogun rookies, like, you know, Balogun rookie blue prism. It's like, well, okay. 
like this is like kind of an important part of this card like you know because when people are just looking and, and glancing if they see that like oh this is serial numbered out of whatever they might stop and actually like yep. okay cool that's cool or look at it but if people aren't like looking at the backs of every single card listed on golden especially when some do have serial numbers on them like some of the bigger ones it's just so frustrating but i don't know and so i've asked them i'm like hey why don't you guys have this part of your curation process right so it's like those are the types of things that like if you're not doing it yourself you almost have to like accept or or be be willing to accept that you just don't have as much control over Yep, that's why I, I said it. I would recommend if you have the time and you want to do it, uh, I would definitely say focus on building your own eBay store, building your feedback and doing it that way. Um, yeah, if, if you have the time and the wherewithal and the want to do it, I would 100% do that as your first choice. Got it. Makes sense. Um, what do you think grading card companies could do to help the hobby at this point? Like not saying like, oh, they're hurting the hobby, but like what meaningful, like what changes at this point would be meaningful in terms of like, helping the hobby ecosystem as it relates to like people raw degrading and just like kind of keeping the ecosystem healthy in general. Yeah. I mean, the only two things they can really do is make it cheaper and get it turned around faster. Um, but at the end of the day, their businesses and they're trying to keep a backlog and run at margins with the, the level of staff that they have. But the only two things they can really control are the speed and the, the price. So, uh, I would like to see them drop prices further, hire more people and get more cards out the door, but they've run out their math equation and it says that uh, their current staffing levels and their current uh, return times are what's going to make them the most money. So it's going to stay like that. Um, yeah. So unless there becomes some sort of big innovation in the world of AI and accurate grading and all that kind of stuff, I just don't think there's much in their power that they can do to help people. Got it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it was interesting because what there was like HGA grading came around and I think tag is also, I don't know if they're like AI or automated, but like the, the level of grading, I don't know if you've ever looked up like a tag card, but it has like, a, um, it has like a number out of a thousand, right? And then depending on what that number is, that gives it like a 10 or a nine or an eight or whatever. But then if you look up the actual card, it'll show you like, okay, this is where this card got dinged, right? So it's like, oh, the back left edge was, uh, you know, 75 out of 100 or whatever, right? And then and then it like adds up. So it's 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 interesting in that way. Uh, I think the issue, I mean, the only issue with that though, right, is that like, there's still this like, PSA just has this like, you know, brand name. Yeah, and, then, and at the end of the day, we can it. have it be as fancy and as technologically sound as we can and get it down to a thousand point scale, but people just want a 10 it's exactly. it's at the end of the day you don't want to have to know what those small flaws are if it's a if it's a psa 10 it's a psa 10 and that's why i think they've carved out such a big lead on everybody else besides the fact that their infrastructure is a million times ahead of everybody else it's just that the grading scale is is so simplistic and it's what the market wants right now do you think that if sgc got rid of sgc 9.5 it would help yes like something like that I, I, 9.5 is just a weird grade. It's it's less weird when it's Beckett because that's their gem mint. Sure. But with SGC, 9.5 is like a PSA 9.5 and, and people just don't know what to do with that. Yeah, I think people bu people buy it and crack it out and send it to PSAs. I think that's that's, that's what I've done. I've done it a few times in the past. Usually I have good results, but cracking is a, it's a whole different experience. I So side note on that, I bought a PSA. Well, this is actually kind of like a double maybe negative story but like I, I i was doing the same thing i'm gonna buy a psa or a sgc nine and a half because hey it's gonna be a psa ten. good chance good chance at a psa 10 right and uh i bought a desmond ritter i never buy football i bought a desmond ritter select rookie uh green out of five and i actually got it for you know based on comps and things like much cheaper than i thought i'm like okay so if this gets a 10 like this is like huge upside Yep. And I get the card and, you know, you kind of look at it just to be like, okay, like make sure it doesn't have anything obvious. And like the back corner is like clearly Dang. not PSA 10. So I'm like, well, that sucks. And then he got benched the week, the week right <laughs> after I bought it. So now I'm like, well, now I have a Desmond Ritter rookie that uh, hopefully he gets uh, some playing time. And I can so, so no more SGC cracking and no more football for you. Well, I, I did the same thing with a CSG uh, Musa rookie, um, an Obsidian rookie, which maybe that was my mistake too. It was like a thicker card, but it was a 9.5 and it had all 9.5 subgrades. I'm like, great, this has got to be a PSA 10. And I got it. And there's like a clear like corner. Like if I yeah. can see it through the case, it's like a PSA grader is going to see it when they 
you know, when they when they inspect it, right? And then it's just gonna get a nine. So it's like, well, that's kind of kind of annoying. But yeah, I recently gave up cracking myself after a, a couple experiences. One of them was I had a CSG, I think it was a nine of the Mbappe Adrenaline rookie, the the actual rare one, the one with the white jersey. So it was the highest graded CSG one. And so I was like, if I crack this and it gets a PSA eight, I'm gonna do crazy numbers on it. Mm. So I crack it, immediately look at the top right corner, it's dinged. Like it's gonna be like a PSA six. And so I was like, oh, man. So I just had to auction it off raw, and I was done with that. Um, but the one that actually made me quit recently was I bought a uh, one of those Chinese slabbed full and Balogun blue prism rookies in a Chinese grade 9.5. And usually they grade pretty tough. I try to crack it. I cannot get this case open. It is still <laughs> sitting in my closet, and I can't get it open. I've tried everything to get this case open, and I just can't do it without doing something that would break the card. So... From wow. there, I've, I've given up on on my crack and resub, and I'll just be doing raw from now on. I think the new I've seen videos at the new PSA cases, like the thicker cases that they use for like obsidian or like thicker card yeah. are like that, too, where it's like people crack them and it's like they literally have to like hold it open and pull the card out. Like it's a very like risky process or whatever, if you will. Um, yeah, to crack this Balogun that I have, I would have to like bend the card. And so I've, I've just sort of given up on it for now. Maybe I'll come back to it at some point, but. Wow. You know. <laughs> it's just like you have to come up with like the new age of cracking strategy to uh, attack the. That, that's actually how the graders can help us is they can let us crack their slabs easier. <laughs> just make cheaper slabs so we can crack them. Yeah. Then, yeah. Um, all right. Well, maybe uh, like as we take everything we talked about and start thinking about you know, going into next year, 2024, um, I guess it doesn't have to be 2024 specific, but just like going forward, like, how do you, th how are you kind of thinking about approaching the market in, in the terms of like raw to grade, trying to build up, you know, funds for your PC? Like what are maybe some of the things you're leaning into going forward here in the next like six to 12 months? Yeah, like I said, um, focusing on what's been working for me uh, over the past six months or so, which has been obvious players, obvious sets, raw to grade, and then trying to figure out what to do with uh, the funds from that in terms of building out my PC. I think I've spent a lot of time this year in 2023, as I look back, really getting back into the groove of raw to grade, because I didn't really do it at all in 2022, because it was too expensive. And in 2021, COVID shut down most of the major grading, so you couldn't do as much. But I've done a lot of raw to grade this year, and I, I feel really good about the raw to grade that I've been doing. Now, as I move into 2024, I really want to focus on what I want my PC to look like. So I'm sort of been at this point where 2023 was a big work year for me. And then 2024, I really want to focus on the fun of what that work has brought me. Um, but I think you probably show this as well. When you get into the raw to grade cycle, it's hard to turn it off in terms of, all right, now I'm going to stop raw to grading and I want to buy some PC stuff because you look at it and it's like, man, if I buy this PC card for $1,000, you know how many raw cards that is? And I can keep the yeah. flywheel going. So I, I'm at this point where I'm, I'm trying to find uh, where the stop on the flywheel is. And as I moved into 2024, I'm going to try and figure out where I wanted that to be because raw to grade is a lot of fun, but at the end of the day, it needs to be for something. For something. Yeah, I do. I do find the same. Like I, I just do struggle with that. What I've started doing is basically just like having like, here's my pool of funds. And as long as I have, like, as long as I'm not completely draining it to buy like a PC card, okay, like I'll, bu I'll buy it um, because I do want to keep stuff in there to, cause I am constantly buying and then constantly grading. And then, you know, you grade, you get the, the invoice from PSA and that's obviously like a, a big price that you have to then like sell to, to cover. So um, yeah, I, I, I definitely identify with that. What, what I guess in terms of like, if somebody wanted to start raw grading, who maybe is either new to the hobby or just like hasn't really done much like raw grading. What's some advice that you would give them, you know, given like the, the current state of things, like, like what are maybe like a few pieces of advice to kind of set them on the right path, get them started. And, and I think most importantly, like something I know you and I share is like allow them to have fun. Right. Cause like, that's the whole point. It's like, we don't do this as like a business. So yeah. it's like we, we obviously do it because we enjoy doing it because it's fun to like find the cards. It's fun to grade the cards, fun to get them back, sell them. What would your advice be for someone starting out? Yeah, I would say if you're going to do it, you need to be really in the weeds of it in terms of you're going to really want to know your your math equation. Now, the math equation is not hard, but you're going to want to do it. And so I would say 
I definitely think Rod of Grade is the most fun that I have in the hobby, but you really got to, I, I think it takes a special kind of person to enjoy the grind of the Rod to Grade. And if you're not going to enjoy the grind, then it's, it's not going to be a fun process for you because the amount of time I spend looking for cards on or bidding on cards that I never win is so much higher than the cards that I actually do end up winning. So it, it really is a grind and you got to embrace, embrace and enjoy the grind. But yeah, if you're if you're looking at getting started, run out the equation, set aside a budget for yourself. It you want to put yourself in a position to be successful. So I would say you probably need north of $100 to do it because you want to expose yourself to enough probability. You need a big enough sample size for the numbers to play out for you. So something above $100, you don't need to go crazy and spend thousands of dollars doing it, but $100 gets you two or three graded cards. You probably want to be more in like 10 graded cards or so. So um, look up videos on how to identify good candidate raw cards. Look up how to clean cards with a microfiber, not cleaning as in like using chemicals and, and all that sort of stuff. But get yourself a microfiber, learn how to wipe down a card, learn what to look for for grading. Um, partner with um, a group submitter, because if you're not knowing how to use PSA or it's a little intimidating, I would use a group submitter because they'll fill out all the paperwork for you and take care of that aspect. So uh, partner with a group submitter. Um, and yeah, just run out the numbers and put yourself in a position to succeed because I, I don't think it's hard, but you're going to want to love the grind and embrace the grind because it's, I think it's really easy now because I've done it for so long, but getting into it, I, I imagine it's not easy at all. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that's good advice. And um, yeah, what, um, anything else that's top of mind for you before we, before we call it? Um I know there's always kind of a lot going on in the hobby and I know you and I talk quite a bit like Instagram and stuff, but, uh, yeah, just any, anything else that's top of mind. Yeah. Um, I think the more time I spend in the hobby, uh, the more I start to enjoy the, the simpler cards because uh, a lot of the stuff recently it's come out is, uh, there's always a new set. There's always a new a case hit, a new insert set that everybody's gunning for the more of these things that start to come out and even the new ones, they, they keep selling for big numbers and stuff. The more I start to look back on the older stuff and feel like, huh, it was a lot simpler back then. And I kind of like the simplicity of that. So for example, for Messi, I, I don't have one yet, but I imagine at some point in the next year, I'll get a 71 biz just because I look at back at that card and I compare it to all the new stuff that's coming out. That doesn't really mean anything to me, but I look at that 71 biz as it's a, it's a really special singular card. Now it's a base card and there's quite a few of them out there, but that's, that's like the messy rookie card. And so I, I'm, I'm starting to be more drawn to the simplistic cards while I understand there's all this new stuff and people get excited about it. Um, me personally, I'm coming more and more back to the, the super simplistic stuff that's in the market. Yeah, I think it's hard. I think the thing that gets me is just all the refractors. Like, I don't mind the new sets. I don't even mind that there's a lot of sets if all of the sets had like the standard historical refractors because it would make each of those. It would make even like a purple on a 250 for, you know, call it like a Topps Chrome, for some, for example, be meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. But now it's like everything is like speckle and lava and night vision and like diamond. It's like... They have to print like, more product. <laughs> I know, but it's like, there's like, even the gold refractors now, it's like, okay, there's a gold refractor out of 50. Then there's also like a gold speckle refractor out, out of 50. 50. And there's like a gold diamond refractor out of fit or like, you know, there's like three different, it's like, well, okay, well, one of these is like actually gold. The other ones are like, you know, gold adjacent, like how, you know, and it's just like, I think it almost dilutes like the whole thing. And I think that's why like my focus has been more like specifically on like 2017 Chrome because that's like, it's simple, right? It's like yep. there, there's literally six colors and you know, that it's like, that was the original, um, at least in the soccer hobby, like that was the original, like six refractors. And, you know, even, even if you look at like 2018, there's more than just that six. So it's like every year since then there's, there's been colors and refractors added and, like, I think eventually it's like, I, I don't know where it ends, right? Like we, we have refractors or parallels out of like 399 again. Like, does that go to yeah. 699? Does that go to 999? 1990, you know, 2024 next year? Like, what are we doing? You know? Yeah, no, I, and each year it's just, it's, it's even more sets and even more parallels. And I might be getting more old and rigidy as, as I sit in the hobby every few years, because I have to learn even more than I did in the previous year. And so it makes me want to go back to when it was simpler than it is now, because 
the way I, I separate out modern and ultra modern and all that sort of stuff, as I sort of cut it off at 2018, you look at anything past that, the parallels start getting really crazy. And there's so many sets that, yeah, I just, I just long for the days of the simplicity because it, it, it made my job of, of raw grading a lot easier. And it, I just felt it was more enjoyable when I didn't have to have like a PhD and all these different checklists to understand what was going on. Yeah. My hope is that like, even with all these like new, because like the current trend is like, there's more, there's more sets, there's more cards in each set. There's more, you know, more parallels. My hope is that something in the next couple of years at some point will, it'll either slip under the radar and become like, you know, the, like the, the Panini treble set or like, you know, like the, the, the set that people kind of find are like, Oh, we need to like go after this or, um, like, I think I mentioned this, uh, I forget where I mentioned this, but I was, I was thinking about like, um, maybe in like a video I did, but it was like, oh yes, yeah, somebody in like the AMA I did, they had asked like, wh like what sets do you think are going to be relevant like in the future? And the one way I was thinking about it was, you know, we talk about like the Bowman Chrome and baseball. And if there was a, a, a possibility that tops decided to pivot like Merlin, for example, to be that for soccer, Oh, you know, or if we had anything like that for like other sports too, right? Because to me, that would be something where that would provide like immediate relevance to that set and also make it very clear that like, this is what this set is all about. I think one of the problems with like all the sets, well, one, it's that there's a lot of sets, but two, it's just that why should I be targeting like stadium club versus finest versus tops Chrome versus what, you know, name your, name your set. Right. I think that's like select FIFA, whatever. Like, I think that's the problem for me is, it's just like, there's not like a reason, like even like the world cup sets, it's like, Oh, it's the world cup. Like that makes sense. Right. Tops Chrome. I think is the other one where it's like, that's like the top set or it has been at least for, you know, since 2017. But a lot of these other ones, it's like, even though I like them or even though I think they look cool, it's almost like what, like almost like what's the point of them. Um, and that's where I'm hoping that maybe at some point, like the positioning of some of these sets becomes at least like a little more like clear and obvious, but yeah, I, I think that's one of the big triggers. And one of the big things I, I think the soccer market really needs is it's Bowman Chrome first prospect auto, because in, even in football, we have the silver prism rookie card for quarterbacks is the one you want to get. Now you can go higher and get NTRPAs, but even then there's like two very obvious cards for soccer. We don't, we don't know what that is. Um, yeah. is it the tops Chrome gold? Is it the finest gold? There's just not an obvious set. And I think even in basketball, it's, it's the silver prism rookie. So it would be really nice if we had a consistent set and a consistent, this is the rookie card you want. Cause I, like you said, I, I think we're desperately missing that. And soccer is the hardest category to understand, even in going back to pre-modern and vintage, it's the hardest one to understand. And so if you ever want to get new entrants, we need something easy. There's nothing easier than silver prism is the rookie to go for it. There's nothing easier than Bowman Chrome first prospect. Everybody has one. This is the card to go for. I really think we need that for soccer. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Well, I guess on that note, we'll shut it down for now. We'll, uh, we'll pick up this conversation again in the future. I'm sure, uh, before we leave, I don't know if maybe you want to let everyone know where they can find you. Um, you know, shout out your, your handles and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, James cards FC on YouTube and Instagram. Uh, eventually I'll get back to making videos, but still doing a bit of a break right now as I figure out where I'm going to pivot from here. If you do want to see videos about like any soccer card topic ever, that's probably been covered on my channel at some point. So, uh, there's a lot on there to, uh, to learn from, I hope. Um, but yeah, no, uh, Seth makes great content as well. So definitely check out his channel if you're on it for that reason. So a lot of good stuff out there. Um, to be excited about in our market and in the markets in general and uh just happy to always talk about it for sure yeah 2024 will be the year of the, the content hopefully <laughs> uh, as long as we win copa america that's true that's true <laughs> all right james thanks again for stopping by and we'll uh talk to you soon all right thank you much all right take care Bye.